Welcome back to the channel, and today we're talking about the Yannick TP9 SFX. But because this is America. We're gonna call it the Canic TP9 SFX. Are you ready? Stand by. So welcome back to the channel guys. A lot of you have commented on this gun in my comments saying I should check one out. So I finally broke down and borrowed one to check out in a review. And for the YouTube sensors, this gun may look like it's been modified, but it has not. This is totally stock. The magazines look like this and it comes with an electronic sight in some models out of the box. So this gun is totally unmodified. And the TP9 SFX is a competition gun, although it gets repurposed for home defense or potentially even carry. But I'm gonna come at it through the lens of a competition gun and I am a competition shooter. This gun is intended for USPSA, carry optics and production division, both of which I am a master. In, but would also be suitable for SSP, ESP, and carry optics in IDPA, as well as potentially three gun. You could shoot this in limiter or even open if you decide to use the slide racker, but you'd be at a pretty steep disadvantage, so we're not going to talk about that. And so a popular thing to say about this particular pistol is that it's a great gun for the money. You can't see somebody say it's a great gun, period. It's always a great gun for the money. And the gun is pretty reasonable if you consider that it's an over five inch gun. In the iron sight trim, it's under $500. And with the optic, like you see here, it's under $700, which nobody can really touch on cost. So it is a very well positioned pistol based purely on cost. And the other refrain about this gun is it's got a great trigger. We'll talk more about that later, but it's a great gun for the money and it's got a great trigger. But it's not great out of the box. And I'm gonna have to start with all of the things that are wrong with the gun and I'm gonna go through it quickly because ultimately this is going to be a positive review on this pistol. So please hold off on the comments until I talk through all of the negatives, but we're just gonna list them out real quick. The first and most important thing about this gun, and this is widely reported and you probably already know what it is if you have one, is that the gun is oversprung out of the box. Now, the competition load that I shoot with is 134 power factor, which is pretty much factory ammunition specs, and this gun was choking on it. I had about a dozen failure to eject out of this gun, and what you get is a stovepipe when the spent case isn't kicked out of the gun, and as you can see in the B-roll, it just doesn't throw brass very far. And that's kind of a problem because this gun actually balances three springs. There is a recoil spring, a trigger spring inside the housing, and the striker spring. So if you were to start monkeying with springs to try and get it to work, it's not just one spring. You're gonna have to balance all three, and that does take an armor level strip to change out all three springs. And the gun has a pretty high bore axis, which is the next issue. So if I hold the gun like you would to fire it, and I put my finger sort of in line with where the barrel is, you can see the chamber there, there's a good bit of separation between the web of my hand and where the bore is. And as a result, you end up getting a gun that flops around quite a bit in recoil. Now putting this on the Mantis X using a two-handed grip, I was getting about four and a half to six degrees of muzzle climb out of the gun, whereas my Glock competition gun will generally get between about three and a half to five. So the muzzle flip is a little bit more. You can learn to stabilize it. And as a result, shooting this gun doing the doubles drill at 10 yards, the hits were sort of unspectacular on the target with lots of vertical stringing, which means I don't have my grip or the timing of the gun quite figured out, but it just goes to show that this gun is harder to shoot at speed than something out of the box like a Glock or potentially the Sig Legion or the other uh, competition guns in the segment. Another issue I had with this gun, and this is a borrowed gun with only about three to 4,000 rounds of use, which is not enough to wear out or degrade the accuracy on a barrel typically. Now using the Caldwell Pistolero Rest, I shot five groups of five at 25 yards using my competition load. My load is typically very accurate in most of the guns that I shoot it out of, and 
and I was getting between three and five inch groups, depending on the group, using a dot with a gun that supposedly has a great trigger, which leaves us with this, the barrel and the lockup is not quite as consistent as other guns in the segment. And for comparison's sake with the Glock 19, I recently was zeroing it at 25 yards and shot a sub two inch group with a flyer that stretched out to about three inches. So this gun is not quite as accurate as the more costly guns in the segment. And did you notice that? Right there, you were thinking it and you maybe even started typing it. Yeah, but that's accurate enough considering what you pay for. It's probably where you were going with it. Hey, if it weren't for double standards, you'd have no standards at all. Shame on you. Shame. Shame. Now getting into some of the less minor issues with the gun is the magwell is like threading a needle. If you look at just how small that magwell is and just how boxy these magazines are, I mean, you have to be pretty much perfect to hit the reload. It's just not as easy to reload as other pistols in the segment. Now the Canik actually comes with a slide racker, which you can see hanging off the optics plate. So you can actually cycle the slide by pulling back on it like that, which is great if you've got arthritic hands and can't get good grasp on the slide to charge the gun, but it's basically illegal for all the divisions in which this gun is competitive. So if you decide to use this fancy slide racker they give you, welcome to open division, you're gonna get smoked by everybody. And Canik took cues from Glock in providing these little indentations for your thumb to reach the magazine release. I hate these things. They're on Glocks. I hate them. Every gun that has these, I hate them. This is the area where your support hand is supposed to mate with the grip. And for them to run the grip away from your hand, it, it doesn't improve anything. It does give you better access to the magazine release. But I would rather have a solid surface providing great traction for my firing grip rather than this kind of sculpted bit for my thumb. And since the magazine release is extended from the factory, it's even less of an issue. So it's just like, why not just have the extended release and ditch the thumb depression? But if you're shooting your gun with a thumb depression to your support side or the left for right-handed shooters, I've got another video that can help you fix that. And probably an issue that is the least important is the gun, the balance is just a little bit top heavy due to the high bore axis. It's not my favorite the way it balances, but it's honestly not that bad and it's not that much of a gripe. Now those are all the negatives that I've got with the pistol and how big a deal are they really? Well, Canik will actually send you a reduced power recoil spring to help fix the ejection issue. The high bore axis you can train around. It's not that big a deal. There are plenty of guns with high bore axis that people are having success with like the SIG P320X5. It's got a very high bore axis as well and people absolutely love it. The accuracy, it's plenty accurate enough for practical shooting. I was able to shoot plate racks at 25 yards. I could back it up to 50. It wasn't a big deal to make hits with the gun. It's just for precision group shooting accuracy, this gun isn't gonna win any prizes. The Magwell, again, you can train around it. It's just not that big a deal in carry optics where you're reloading once or maybe an IDPA where you're reloading once per stage. If you were reloading in production two to three or even four times a stage, this could be pretty annoying. But if you're shooting a high cap division, it's probably not the end of the world. The slide racker you can leave in the box and the problem is solved. And as I mentioned, the balance really isn't that big a deal. We did it guys. We got through all the negatives. Hopefully you haven't left me hateful comments yet. So while we're taking a breather guys, go ahead and hit that like button. Subscribe if you haven't already. And if you are subscribed, Come up with an interpretive dance to tell your buddies at the range about the channel and the great videos I'm making here. They're probably not gonna know what it means, but it'll be pretty funny to them and me thinking about you doing that. So get on that. But jokes aside, do comment right now. I just listed out a ton of negatives about a pistol I like. What is your favorite pistol and what is the biggest negative you can say about it? Cause let's face it, none of them are perfect. So as we're starting to feel good about the Canik, Let's stop and talk holsters. Holsters were hard to find initially for this gun. I was lucky enough to have this holster sent in by Renaissance Firearms, and this is their Copernicus competition model. So it's a real treat to be able to review a gun with actual competition gear. And this is a dual layer Kydex holster made specifically for the TP9 SFX. It's got a great drop offset hanger and it's got the turbo prop. So it's very sturdy, very rigid, and pretty doggone well made. Check them out if you're looking for a holster for a Canik in the competition space. So let's talk about the positives on the Canik. First and foremost, you would never know this is a value gun when you pick it up and hold it. It just feels like a quality gun. The frame doesn't have any flashing or cheap molding feel to it. The polymer feels like it's made out of quality. 
the controls and everything feel super solid and that translates, believe it or not, into the box. Now, generally, I hate gun caboodles. I wish everybody would get on board with giving us pistol rugs with the pistols, but the gun caboodle that comes with the TP9 SFX is actually really well made. First and foremost, it's very size efficient and the foam is routed out for everything that comes with it and all the extra screws and plates and all that kind of stuff is even molded right there into the foam. The case on this gun is nicer than the CZ Tactical Sport Orange, which costs about three times as much as this pistol. So the experience of opening up the case and getting at the gun is actually quite good. So despite the magwell issue, the frame is set up pretty well. It's got bumpy traction on the front strap and on the back strap of the gun that actually do an okay job of biting in on your hand. On the side panels, they've got this more fissured fine texture you can see kind of right there. And it's not great, honestly. Uh, you probably, if you're the kind of guy who likes to use a lot of side to side traction to grip the gun, then you're gonna want some decal grips for this bad boy. But if you're more of a front to back guy, you're gonna be pretty pleased with how this grip feels. The sculpt around the grip tang is quite good. It doesn't dig in the web of your hand, anything like that. Small handed shooters are gonna have an okay time with the trigger reach. It is absolutely not bad at all. Now talking about the controls walking around the pistol, the slide stop slide release is only on the left side of the gun. So you lefties, it's just more proof that no one likes you, but it falls exactly where you would want it to be. It's very easy to actuate and it doesn't really get in the way when you're building a high grip on it either. I didn't have any issues with getting the slide to lock back. The mag catch mag release actually is extended and it comes in the box with like three different attachments to tune the release height to whatever it is you want. So that's really awesome and provides a lot of value right out of the box. And other manufacturers would do good to take cues from Canik on this because the aftermarket isn't gonna jump in and save you for poorly designed stuff. So they give you the pieces that you would want to potentially change out right out of the box, which is a pretty awesome value. This magazine release is probably my second favorite I've encountered on a competition pistol. The first favorite being on the CZ Shadow 2. That one's just brilliant. And now the moment you've all been waiting for is the trigger. Now the trigger on the Canix is, from what I understand, licensed from the Walter P99, which is why the Canix and the Walters can share a bunch of parts, apparently. The trigger is quite good. The trigger on this model, which has been shot in, like I said, about three to 4,000 rounds, was breaking just under four pounds for me. And it is a very, very short trigger. The take up is super duper smooth and you hit a wall and it is a firm wall. There's not a lot of squish or creep to pull through and you can just hold it right on the wall easily enough and then it breaks and there's like almost no over travel. The reset similarly is pretty good and very, very, very short. That is a very short reset. So it's very easy to run this gun quickly if you can control the muzzle flip. The shape of the trigger is quite good. It is pretty broad and the trigger safety does go flush with the face of the trigger, which is a pet peeve of mine on some other guns. But the trigger shape out of the box is pretty squared away. And for people who love to compare guns to other guns, this is probably better than any other plastic gun, except maybe the Walters. The trigger is that good. Even you P10 guys, I'm sorry, but this trigger, in my opinion, is better than the P10 trigger. Now let's talk about the slide. The, the machining on the slide is pretty squared away. And while it does have a high bore axis, they actually do a number of things to get the weight down below the bore. So if you actually view the slide in profile, you notice that it kind of kicks out at the bottom. They've machined off the, kind of the tops all the way back uh, to cut down weight and they've knocked off the angles right there and give it a flat top pretty much as flush with the top hood of the barrel as you can get. So they've reduced the weight tremendously from the slide and they've even done weight relieving holes or windows here to knock down the weight even further. And as a result, the slide is pretty light. It, it is not a heavy slide and it's even got high power cuts as you can kind of see there, sort of machined in on the slide. Now the front serrations don't come up high enough if you'd like to rack based off of an overhand grip. Pretty much the area that you'd make traction with the gun is right there where they stop. And as a result, I found myself using the high power cuts to manipulate the slide. I'm a guy who likes to move the slide from the front and I didn't have any issues with it. The rear serrations are pretty doggone grippy, not bad at all. The slide looks pretty cool for a service pistol in this segment. I think it probably is one of the better looking slides 
that uh, you can get from a factory gun. And moving on to their optic system, you can see the aluminum plate right there that they provide that makes up with most of the major optic brands that are on the market presently. And there is a hole for the slide racker that is drilled and tapped on each side. So when you don't use the slide racker, uh, that's where it goes if you decide you do want to use it. Now the recoil bosses that actually come on the plates are very well made. It has no problems mating up with the optics. It's hand in glove exactly how you would imagine it. So the plates are very light. They're relieved a lot on the bottom. And as a result, it keeps the weight down on the slide even further, which is good because you don't want a bunch of reciprocating mass. Talking about iron sights, the rear sight is gonna come on its own plate. And if you take a look at that, that is a Warren Tactical iron sight that they buy from the factory, install in the factory, and they give you a fiber optic front just like you would expect to see on any proper competition gun. These sights, I can say from the factory, are the best sights anyone is providing up to the Sig Legion, which is a $900 gun. I'm a big fan of the Warren Tactical sights, and I think it's awesome that Canik chose to include these from the factory. Now, talking about the Vortex Venom that this gun came with, I mean, it's okay. The window size is pretty good actually. It's, it's, it's not bad at all for a competition use optic. The optic body is pretty fat and the way that it attaches to the gun, you don't have the opportunity for co-witness, but for a competition gun, that's no big deal. The glass is pretty clear. It doesn't discolor your target basically at all. And the emitter is pretty good. It gets pretty bright. This is a six MOA and I honestly loved how it looked on targets. It reminded me of my Trigicon SRO without all the blue, green tint and distortion. However, I have to say this, because remember it's a good gun for the money. The Vortex Venoms don't hold up. They have a great warranty and they will replace them when they break, but the operative word there is when they break. There's a GM at my local club who had his guns machined for the Vortex Venom. Just this past month at the match, I saw he was still shooting them. I said, hey man, how many of those Venoms have you gone through on your gun? And he'd been shooting carry optics for about two years and he has a pretty high burn rate. He sent back 12 of them. So it's probably gonna work if you're a casual shooter, but it's gonna fail eventually. But they stand by their product and they'll get you a new one real fast. So it's not a bad optic. I honestly quite like it for the money. And if you're a casual guy, I think it's a good optic. Now the magazines are a good news, bad news situation. The magazines are quality. It says right on the front of them that they are made by Mechgar, which is one of the best ma magazine manufacturers in the world. However, they're very hard to find. So if you wanna buy additional magazines for your shiny new pistol, good luck. Everybody is looking for them apparently. But I had no issues with the magazine. They could do 20 plus one exactly like you would want them to. They're easy to load, they're smooth to load. They feel like a quality magazine. So all in all, the TP9 SFX is set up very well from the factory for competition shooting. It may not be quite as high speed as some of the other offerings that you're gonna see at the match, but you're really not leaving much on the table with this bad boy. And to that point, Nils Jonasson shot these at the USPSA Nationals in 2019, and he took second at 99% of the winner, and in carry optics, he came in third at 94%. So clearly the gun's not holding him back any. The thing is totally squared away for competition. So if you're still here and you think you would pay a quarter to watch this video, consider going over to Patreon and supporting me there. Just just a dollar a month will get you access to my blog where we talk about technique, we talk about competition stuff. You'll get to see all this stuff early and the support really helps make more videos like this. But that's what I got for you guys. I appreciate you watching. Hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll catch you on the next one. Take care, guys.